All right, welcome everyone. Please, uh, if you haven't already, take your seats and we'll begin the program shortly. My name is Paul Edgar and I am the Interim Executive Director of the Clement Center for National Security. On behalf of the Clement Center and the Strauss Center for International Security and Law, welcome to a conversation on the state of foreign affairs with Secretary Antony Blinken. I have two important notes, and then I have three very short but important thank yous, and then I'll welcome and thank our university president, uh, who will formally introduce our distinguished guests. Uh, but let me open with uh, one sentence, a quote from Governor Bill Clements while he was still Deputy Secretary of Defense in 1973. He said, let us never send the President of the United States to the conference table as the head of the second strongest nation in the world. And in many respects, that single sentence summarizes what we are doing here today. Okay, so two notes. First, you may be familiar with the nationwide emergency alert test, <laughs> which is scheduled for about 19 and a half minutes from right now. Uh, so that we don't interrupt the conversation, please put your phones on airplane mode. I have told that's the way to, to go about this. I also recommend that you keep your phone close at hand, not so you can text your friends, but so that when you suddenly realize that you didn't actually put it on airplane mode, you can quickly silence it when it squawks in about 19 minutes. Uh, second, this is for our students. Our new Texas diplomat in residence, Mr. Daniel Stewart, has a recruiting booth set up right next door on the first floor of Flan Academic Center. So immediately after this event, all of you who are students, get five friends, go over to FAC, and tell Mr. Stewart that you want to be a State Department Foreign Service Officer or a civil servant. The 2030 plan, the 2030 State Department plan, and I, and I think the Secretary is going to mention this during his remarks, we want every single Foreign Service Officer and Civil Servant to be from the University of Texas. <laughs> That's the master plan. But seriously, go visit Daniel and learn about opportunities in the Department of State and then go upstairs to the fourth floor and learn how the Clements Center can help you get there. And now three brief thank yous. First, thanks to Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students, uh, Soncia reagans Lilly, and her absolutely amazing staff for the tremendous effort required to prepare this venue. Thank you to UTPD for the Herculean and absolutely professional security effort. Welcome to our University of Texas System Chancellor, J.B. Milliken. Thanks for joining us today. And I want to thank you and the system regents especially for your gracious and generous support uh, of our National Security and Foreign Policy Journal, the Texas National Security Review. Last, I'd like to welcome our University of Texas President, Jay Hartzell. And while doing so, thank him for all he has done for the study of foreign affairs and national security on this campus. Jay, thanks for supporting the centers, schools, and departments that educate and train our students who are pursuing careers in this field, and thank you for supporting our scholars who contribute to the improvement of policy making. I could not think of a more appropriate person to introduce our distinguished guests. Ladies and gentlemen, President Jay Hartzell. Thanks a lot, Paul. And um, I have uh, in remarks, uh, I want to say thanks to, to Paul for what he's doing. Uh, for everything he's doing except wearing a maroon blazer <laughs> this week, um, as I told him before, this is not the difficult part of your job. Uh, good afternoon to all of you uh, and to Secretary Blinken, Senator Hutchison, all of our esteemed guests, uh, welcome. And I want to say a special welcome and a shout out to our students in the audience today. Seeing today's conversation is the type of opportunity made possible by attending a world-class university such as ours and the place that hosts centers like the Clement Center and the Strauss Center which make all of this possible. I want to say thanks to Paul Edgar, to Adam Klein, who is running the, the Strauss Center. Uh, say also thanks to Dean, Dean J.R. DeShazo from the LBJ School and for Pref Professor Sheena Greitens for all the work that went into this. So thank you for all you're doing to lead us along the way. How about a round of applause for them? This is a truly special occasion, and not only because of the nature of our guests here today, 
but also because it's the first event here in this gorgeous auditorium since this remodel was, re was finished. This is the very first theater built on the campus, and in the 90 years since its completion, it's seen a lot of history. We produced some amazing alumni in that time, including Secretary of Education, William Bennett, Secretary of Commerce, Don Evans, and two Secretaries of State, Rex Tillerson and James Baker. We've got a third Secretary of State with us today, Secretary Antony Blinken. Secretary Blinken was confirmed in 2021, but his distinguished service record began long before that. His expertise in the public sector over the last 30 years and for three presidential administrations has been shaping U.S. foreign policy to ensure the protection of this country's best interests and upholding the values that define us. After translating his background as a successful attorney in the private sector, Secretary Blinken founded West Exec Advisors, an international strategic consulting firm focusing on geopolitics and national security. Also joining us here today is an amazing alumna of UT, the first woman from Texas to serve in the U.S. Senate, Kay Billy Hutchison. Senator Hutchison served in the U.S. Senate from 1993 to 2013. After her service as Senator, she was named the U.S. Permanent Representative to NATO in 2017, a position she held until 2021. Senator Hutchison has protected our interests on the global stage, and we could think of no better person to represent both UT and to host this conversation with Secretary Blinken on our behalf. Senator, thank you for being here today and for your service to our university, our state, and our country. Mr. Secretary, thank you for coming to the University of Texas, and thank you for your service to our country. This is an important occasion for our university, and it fits our role. Former UT President Harry Ransom described the UT campus as a field of ideas, and that is certainly true today as we welcome our esteemed guests. We also have another field on our minds this week, Mr. Secretary, one that's about 200 miles north of here. <laughs> Amidst our anticipation and preparation for Saturday, it is great for you to be here and help us focus on this important and weighty issues facing our country and the broader world. That said, in addition to saying thank you, we want to applaud the wisdom of your choice to visit this university during this week <laughs> on the preferred side of the Red River. Please join me with a round of applause welcoming Secretary Blinken and Senator Hutchins for him to take the stage. Well, I welcome you to the University of Texas. Thank you. And I want to tell all of you how unusual it is for a Secretary of State to be able to travel within our country because he has so many responsibilities outside our country. And we appreciate you making time Thank you, for us and to be able to learn some of the things that uh, you're dealing with and that our future generation will also deal with. So we are glad you're here. I want to say that um, you have written, you have such a long history of foreign policy, uh, being the head of the uh, Foreign uh, Relations Committee, and um, so you have known uh, all of the things that have been happening. And I would like for you to take a look at where we are now and where you think we are going and what you are going to try to put forward for a way forward in a world that's very, very tough right now. Thank you, Kay. It's, first, it's wonderful to be with you. Uh, I had the great privilege of working in the Senate when um, the senator was a senator, and it was a privilege to be able to, uh, to work with you then, and of course your remarkable service as our ambassador to, to NATO at a tumultuous time. Uh, and it's wonderful to be back here today. Uh, Mr. President, thank you very much for your kind introduction. I did have one extremely important statement to make before I get into the conversation. Hook 'em horns. <laughs> and uh, can I just add to that? This Maybe with a little help. Beat. Oh, you. Thank you. Oh, man. You know your audience. We can tell that. 
<laughs> so uh, with that great beginning, uh, tell us what you're seeing out there with the bad guys that are festering and where we ought to be in dealing with them. So I think as we're, as we're looking at it, and the president's looking at it, he talks about the moment we're in as being an inflection point. And if you think about it, what that is is something that comes around not every couple of years, not even every decade, but maybe every five or six, or seven generations, where the changes are so profound um, and also so complex that in that moment, the decisions that you make then uh, are going to have repercussions, not just for the next few years, but likely for the next decades. We had an inflection point after World War II. We had another one after the end of the Cold War. And we believe we're in one of those right now. Uh, you have a re-emerging great power competition that is primarily engaged in shaping what the future looks like. Uh, we're, we, we've hit the end of the post-Cold War era, and now there's a competition on to shape what comes next. And at the same time, we have extraordinary transnational challenges, issues that are affecting people in every corner of our globe, including here in the United States, whether it's food security, whether it's climate, whether it's the way all of these emerging technologies are being used, whether it's mass migration. And for each and every one of these issues, and so many more, I think one of the recognitions that we have to have is that as strong and powerful as we are as a country, um, none of us, not even the United States, can effectively deal with these challenges alone. So both in terms of the great power competition and shaping what the world looks like uh, and dealing with some of these extraordinary challenges, there's a premium on two things. There's a premium on American engagement and American leadership because in the absence of us doing that, one of two things. Either someone else is going to do it and probably not in a way that reflects our interests or values or maybe just as bad, no one does it. And then you have a vacuum that's likely to be filled by bad things before it's filled by good things. But equally, there's a premium on finding new ways to cooperate, to coordinate, to work with other countries toward common purpose. And here, it's my profound conviction, and I've seen this play out over the last two and a half years, um, no country on earth has a greater ability to mobilize others in positive collection action, collective action than the United States. So as we're thinking about all of these problems, that's what we're doing. Last thing is this, Kay. I think it all starts at home. It starts with our strength at home, our investments in ourselves. We've made historic investments over the last few years. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, the Chips and Science Bill, the Inflation Reduction Act, all going to put us in a stronger position, not only to do well by, by people at home, but also to compete effectively in the world. And if you have a strong foundation at home, it does wonders for your standing and your strength around the world. That's what we're seeing play out every single day around the world. Let's drill down into Ukraine, because a number of people have said, this is not our war. Um, why should we be putting our treasure into Ukraine? And I'd like for you to address that, because it's very important if we're going to stay the course, we need to have the reasons to stay the course. You're, you're absolutely right. And I think it's, it's really important that we continue to have this conversation about why it is important, uh, at least from our perspective. Although I believe uh, when we continue to see it, very strong support, um, really, uh, both parties, uh, both houses in Congress, and also even uh, public opinion, as, as I've seen it. But here's what's, what's going on and why we thought it was so important for the United States to, to lead. There are really two reasons, and they're, again, flip sides of, of the same coin. On the one hand, we see the incredible human tragedy that is the Russian aggression against Ukraine. We see that human tragedy and what's being done to the Ukrainian people. Uh, and I think most Americans see that, and it's something that, uh, that bothers them, that uh, they want to, if we can, help put a stop to. Quick uh, aside, I was, in Ukraine for, uh, I guess, the fourth time since the Russian aggression a couple of weeks ago, and visited a town called Yehidny, which is about two and a half hours drive outside of Kyiv. Very small town. We visited a schoolhouse, um, and when the Russians came in, back in February of 2022, they took over this town, they herded up all of the folks in the town, 
and they had a command post in, on the first floor of the, the schoolhouse, they put everyone else in a basement. Now, the basement was not fit for human habitation, uh, but they herded everyone into a room that was probably maybe about the size of the stage, a little smaller, 130 people for 28 days. Children as young as a month and a half old. Uh, adults as old as 85, 90. In that room, which didn't have proper ventilation, uh, 10 people died during those 28 days. Uh, the Russians would not allow the bodies if the people died after noon to be removed. So young children, three, four, five years old, were living in this room, and there was not even enough room to, to lie down for most people uh, with the bodies of people who had died there. Mm. That's just one small microcosm, one small town, one small schoolhouse. So that's one side of the point. But here's the other side of the point, and here's fundamentally why it's so important. Uh, this might be, might be our Russian friends interrupting us. <laughs> well, but I'm glad to know the national alert system works. <laughs> here's, here's, here's what's so important. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were in New York at the United Nations General Assembly, an annual gathering of all the countries at the UN. We call it speed dating for diplomats. <laughs> and it's a useful reminder, though, that the UN came together for a reason. And that reason was this. We'd had two world wars, and there was a fierce determination by people around the world, starting in the United States, to figure out a way to organize ourselves such that another world war wouldn't happen. And so an entire system was developed, starting with the United Nations. And it put in place basic principles, basic understandings among countries about how they would act or not act toward each other. And it's all in the United Nations Charter. And among other things, it commands respect for the territorial integrity of other countries, for their sovereignty, for their independence. Because if you don't have those basic principles, and if big countries can simply lord it over small ones, you're going to have a world where might makes right. And in this case, if we had allowed Russia to do what it did toward Ukraine, to allow that to go forward with impunity, then the signal, the message that sends around the world to other would-be aggressors is, if they can do it and get away with it, I can do the same thing. Uh, it's opening a Pandora's box of conflict. And in that kind of world, uh, a world of conflict, a world of aggression, that's not going to be good for anyone. It's not going to be good for us. It's not going to be good for people around the world. And if you look at history, invariably in that kind of world, we're going to be drawn in, and drawn in in much more costly uh, and difficult ways than we have been uh, in Ukraine. So I think, Kay, it's the combination of something that, that sort of hits our hearts when we see this aggression, but also something I hope that, that, that touches our, our minds, our heads, because we know that if the United States, and by the way, it's not us alone. There are 50 other countries engaged in actively supporting Ukraine. You know this so well from your leadership at NATO. One of the complaints we've sometimes had in the past when we've been engaged around the world is, how come we're carrying all the load? Why aren't others doing their fair share? Well, here they are. If you look at the support being provided to Ukraine right now across military, economic, humanitarian lines, um, actually, the rest of the world is doing a little bit more than we're doing. So we've got great burden sharing. Uh, and I think the fact that so many countries are standing up for the basic principles that are within the UN Charter and that have very imperfectly helped keep the peace over the last uh, 80 or so years, um, that's why it's so important. I, when I was at NATO, our military, this is anecdotal, mm. but our military leaders said that when they met with the Soviet military, that they are brainwashed, mm. that the worst part of history in the history of Russia is the breakup of the Soviet Union. And that's why Putin seems so determined mm. to right this wrong. Uh, he has imbued in his military that Gorbachev is the worst mm. traitor to the mother Russia. And I think that means that they're not going to skirt around NATO countries. They're going to see what we will do, and they are going to act accordingly. 
And if we keep our resolve, as your administration is doing and I agree with, um, then we will protect what we have and make sure that our troops are not going to be called. Because if, if they go into a NATO country, then we are in a war. So I think we have to be forward leaning. I think we have to have the deterrence that we are showing and never stopping with this support of Ukraine. And the Ukrainian people are so brave. They are. And they have not flagged for one minute. And they deserve our support. And if we can see that through with them, then we won't be sending our troops into a bigger conflict. And I think that's why I have said right off the bat that this is an issue for, for Russia, but it's also a signal to other countries that might decide to run over another sovereign nation, like potentially China. Um, and so it is a signal that we would send, but it's also the actuality of standing with Ukraine for our interest. I could agree more. I think you're exactly right. And the challenge that we have now and Ukrainians have now is that one of the things that we think President Putin believes is that he can outlast us. He can outlast the Ukrainians. He can outlast the support that Ukraine is getting. And it's very important that we disabuse him of that notion because that's actually the quickest path to having this resolved, having an end to the aggression, having uh, a just and durable peace. No one wants that more than the Ukrainian people. They're the ones on the receiving end of aggression. Uh, but right now, Putin demonstrates no interest in actually meaningfully negotiating because, exactly as you suggest, he believes he can outlast us. So making sure he understands that he can't, that he won't, is actually critical to getting to peace. Mm -hmm. One of the ways we do that is by sustaining the support and the support of many other countries. Another way we do that is showing that in a different way, we're in this for the long haul. By that I mean this. What we're working on now, besides the immediate support that we're providing to Ukraine along with many other countries, is helping the Ukrainians to build their own force for the future that can deter aggression and, if necessary, defend against it. Um, at the last NATO summit, we had on the margins of that summit all of the G7 countries, the, uh, the largest democratic economies in the world, come together and say, we're going to start engaging Ukraine on how we can provide long-term assistance to them to build up that kind of force. We now have 29 countries who've signed on to do that. And this is a way to be able to help them build that force, to do it in a sustainable way for us in terms of the resources that are required, because it's going to be divided over 30 countries, okay. uh, and uh, to put Ukraine in the position where it can stand on its own feet. Um, at the same time, economically, just as important, they have to have an economy that's functioning. Uh, and to do that, countries have provided a lot of assistance, international financial institutions. But the way to make that durable, sustainable, and lasting is private sector investment. So mm -hmm. we brought back uh, an extraordinary colleague, Penny Pritzker, who was Secretary of Commerce during the Obama administration to lead our efforts mm -hmm. on uh, economic reconstruction for, uh, for Ukraine and getting that private sector money in, and there is tremendous opportunity there, is a way to really get the economy moving, to get the tax base up, to make Ukraine self-sustaining economically. A Ukraine that stands on its own feet is the objective. The more we're doing that, and the more we're showing that that's what we're doing, the more Putin understands that he can't play a waiting game. If you can tell us um, what the status is of being able to use frozen Russian assets to pay for some of the uh, humanitarian reconstruction and uh, all of the things that Ukraine needs right now. Uh, what can you share with us about that? Because it's a significant it is. Uh, amount. It's about $300 be... billion, dollars, uh, and most yeah. of it actually in Europe, not in the United States. So we're looking at what legal authorities uh, we may have, the Europeans may have, to actually use those assets uh, for Ukraine. My own view is, you broke it, you bought it. And so the Russians having broken it, they ought to pay for it. And one way to do that would mm -hmm. be through the use of these assets. We have to, we have to make sure that there is a, a legal basis to do that. And as I said, since most of the assets are in Europe, Europeans also have to be convinced that there's a basis to do it. Mm -hmm.
Okay, I'm going to switch gears now to uh, why you're here. I mean, it's because we're so wonderful, I'm sure. <laughs> but on top of that, you are on your way to Mexico. That's right. And that we, you did make room for us, which I really appreciate. Um, but it is important for us right now. Not only is Mexico uh, our largest trading partner, um, and we want to continue that because a good economy mm -hmm. in Mexico is good for all of us. But also, it is a crisis on the border. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no question that we have an influx that our communities that are very small communities on the border uh, have uh, put in their laps this um, terrible... Um, onslaught of illegal migration, that they don't feel they can take care of people in a humanitarian way. So is this going to be something that will be on the agenda uh, as you are meeting with the uh, Mexican officials? Uh, in short, yes, very much so. But I think it's important to take a step back and recognize where we are, not by way of uh, excuse, but by way of, of, of reality. Um, we are now facing around the world the largest migration challenge uh, of all times. Uh, since we've been keeping numbers on this, we haven't seen the kind of numbers we're seeing now. More than 100 million people on the move, displaced from their homes around the world. Um, that exceeds by far anything we've seen since we've been keeping the numbers. In our own hemisphere, somewhere between 20 and 25 million people on the move. It used to be that you would have one crisis at a time. Maybe Cuba, maybe Haiti, maybe it was El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, the countries in the so-called Northern Triangle. Now it's all of the above, plus Venezuela, plus Nicaragua, plus Ecuador, plus people coming in through um, Latin America from parts far away oh, from yes. the United States, Uzbekistan, all coming toward Mexico and then coming toward the United States. And so I think it's important to to understand that this is, uh, this is actually something that is um, historically of extraordinary proportions. Having said that, it is imperative that we do everything we can as effectively as we can to make sure that migration is uh, humane, uh, safe, and orderly, uh, and we're committed to doing that. We also recognize something that I said a little bit earlier about the imperative of finding ways to work with other countries. Uh, the scale of the problem is such that if we're not doing that, um, we simply won't have an effective solution. We had a summit of the Americas uh, over a, year, a little over a year ago, and that brought together all the countries in the Western Hemisphere. And through that summit, we issued something called the Los Angeles Declaration, which was the first time that virtually every country in our hemisphere acknowledged shared responsibility for dealing with migration. The countries of origin, the countries of transit, the countries of destination, including Mexico and the United States. And what we've been doing since then is translating that into practical things that countries need to do to get a better grip on migration. And that includes everything from building up their own asylum system so that people can actually, if they are going to leave their homes, uh, find asylum in other countries, not just the United States. It means, in some cases, being willing to repatriate, take back, back people who've tried to come here uh, without the uh, legal basis to do so. Um, it means making sure that people are treated in safe and humane ways. Uh, it means working with us to expand their own legal pathways uh, to migration, just as, as we're doing here. In a whole variety of ways, uh, we have been working with these countries to do that. Mexico, of course, has to be and is our closest partner in this for, for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. And here I have to say, uh, we probably have more cooperation with Mexico now than at any time since uh, I've been doing this. They too very much want to get a grip on this because they're now the um, country that has the third largest number of asylum seekers in the world. Uh, this, is, uh, this is affecting them, this is hitting them. So we're working to do that. Uh, we have agreements from many other countries to really step up and do what they need to do. And of course, this is not my area directly, um, we have to work to strengthen what we're doing at our, at our own border, and we have to fix uh, what has long been, unfortunately, a broken asylum system, which is simply 
um, overwhelmed in terms of the demand for asylum versus the resources that are being put against it. Mm -hmm. The very first piece of legislation, actually, that President Biden put before the Congress was an immigration reform bill um, that would have, uh, I think, dealt more effectively with some of these challenges. Unfortunately, it hasn't gone anywhere. But I was just with some of your former colleagues, Kate, and Republicans and Democrats uh, actually talking about the annual refugee program, a distinct mm -hmm. subset of, of uh, migration. And I'm convinced that as we've tried in the past, there really uh, is a, a good, strong nucleus of Republicans and Democrats who can come together to try to actually put in place the fixes that we need to deal with this more effectively. If we can't do that, the problem is not going to be solved. That's absolutely true, and we need to come together on a bipartisan basis because there are differences that would kill any bill. I was trying to get immigration reform yeah. when I was still there, and um, it's just very difficult, but we need to do it because no one expected the, the overwhelming influx especially on these uh, communities in South Texas. You said something else I think that's very, very important, and you all are living and breathing this every day. You're, you're living the challenges and the, the downsides of uh, the migration challenge. You're also living and breathing the um, extraordinary upsides of our relationship with Mexico. As Kay mentioned, Mexico is now, as of a few weeks ago, our largest trading partner in the world. Yeah. Uh, we want to preserve that. Mm -hmm. We want to preserve the, the connections, the bonds that, that, uh, that tie us together. And we also have our share of responsibility. One of the things that drives the, uh, the drug trade uh, that comes here and hits mm -hmm. us, and I want to say a word about that if I could, um, and that facilitates it, is the um, influx of guns coming from the United States to Mexico. We have a responsibility to help them do something about that. And on yeah. drugs, because I think this is very important, if I could, for a second. Uh, the other huge challenge we face, and you all know this so well, is the scourge of synthetic opioids, fentanyl in our case. Uh, devastating, destroying families, communities. The number one killer of Americans aged 18 to 49. And just let that sink in for a minute. Of everything else that's out there, mm -hmm. disease, guns, car accidents, you name it, the number one killer of Americans 18 to 49 is fentanyl. Mm -hmm. So we have an obligation, and we are putting this at the top uh, of our agenda. And here, too, we have what is a global challenge. We've been the canary in the coal mine on fentanyl, but now we're seeing it spread to many other places in the world. The market's so saturated here that these criminal enterprises are going to Europe, they're going to Asia, and all of a sudden, countries are waking up to the proposition that this is going to affect them, too. And then there are other synthetic opioids that are out there, everything from tramadol to methamphetamines to captagon. So this is becoming a global phenomenon, moving from plant-based narcotics to mm -hmm. synthetics. We put together uh, this summer uh, a coalition of about 100 countries now that are determined to work together to better address the problem of synthetic opioids and working in very concrete, specific ways to get at the uh, illicit manufacture of the chemical precursors that go into making them, to uh, their trade mm -hmm. uh, and distribution around the world, uh, working together to look at emerging trends so that we get ahead of the curve, and then the public health aspect, which is so important. How do we do a better job treating people, um, preventing uh, people from using synthetic opioids, et cetera? And that's really the way that you, you get at something like this, as well as, of course, the critical law enforcement work that we're doing and the work that we're doing with Mexico to disrupt mm -hmm. the enterprises, et cetera. We also have to see more cooperation from countries like China, where many of these chemical precursors are made and then diverted illicitly into the manufacture of fentanyl in Mexico, then it gets into the United States. All of that is, um, is coming together, uh, and it's, to us, usually important, but it's also an example of what we've been trying to do around the world. On day one, the instruction that I got from President Biden was to re-engage, re-energize, rejuvenate all of our alliances and our partnerships, like NATO, uh, because we know how important they are to us in terms of dealing with all of these challenges that we can't deal with alone. But we're also in the business of creating new ones. And the way I look at it is, um, especially since we're here at an academic institution, variable geometry, putting together collections of countries and even organizations, businesses, that are different shapes and different sizes, but are fit for a specific purpose. 
that have an interest in solving a particular problem and the means to do it. And that gets you to something like the Fentanyl Coalition. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I have another question on South America, but I want to get to some of the student questions uh, because uh, one of the questions is exactly what I have wanted since I was able to be an ambassador for America. And it is from Angelina Braz, a Clements undergraduate fellow. And she says, Mr. Secretary, in 2011, I lived in Alexandria, Egypt. I find myself, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I found myself watching in real time the air. <coughs> Sorry. Um, the Arab Spring. And I decided I wanted to be in foreign service. Huh. And she wants to know what you're looking for huh. in a foreign service officer that would be part of this. So I, I promise you that's not a planted <laughs> question. So here's the thing. Uh, you know, if you um, maybe watch a popular TV show or have an image in your, in your mind of what the State Department is and what we do, it's, it's accurate, it's, but it's not the whole deal. Because I think when people think of the State Department, maybe they think of issues of, of war and peace and trying to prevent wars or stop wars, uh, building some of these partnerships that I was talking about. But now, pretty much anyone in any discipline at this uh, remarkable institution or others <coughs> would find a place at the State Department to do what you're studying, to do what you love, to do what you want to do. Food security. Um, we are now a leading institution in trying to work around the world to help countries develop sustainable agricultural production so that they can feed themselves and feed others. Climate change. We're playing a lead role in making sure that uh, countries around the world have the, uh, the technology as well as the means to adapt, to build resilience, uh, and to deal with this existential threat, uh, as well as looking at ways to advance their energy infrastructure for the future. Um, if you're interested in global health, I mentioned fentanyl a moment ago. Uh, we played a lead role in making sure that countries around the world had vaccines to deal with COVID. And previous to that, uh, You'll remember we have an extraordinary program called PEPFAR, uh, the president's program to deal with HIV AIDS that President Bush put in place. That's probably saved more than 25 million lives around the world in the 20 years it's been in existence. Um, emerging technologies. We recently stood up a bureau on uh, cyber and digital technology, as well as an envoy for emerging technologies to make sure that the United States is at the table every single place conversations and decisions are being made about the ways the technology we carry in our pockets every day are actually going to be used. What are the rules? What are the norms? What are the standards? To make sure that to the best of our ability, technology is used for good, not for bad. In these and dozens of other ways, no matter what your interest is, um, there's actually a place at the, at the State Department. We have colleagues who are doing remarkable things, making sure that we ourselves can communicate. Uh, we have our colleagues at Diplomatic Security who are uh, making sure that we can do everything we do safely uh, and securely. And we have people who are brilliant at making sure that a, an enterprise as big as the State Department, 80,000 people around the world, uh, can actually function, management, systems, you name it. So it's a long way of saying that um, if you take a look, you may find that um, whatever your passion is, whatever your skill set is, whatever your interest is, there's a way of doing that at the State Department. And here's the one extra thing that you get that flag behind your back every day, literally or figuratively. I've had the chance in my career to do some different things in the private sector, in the not-for-profit sector, all wonderful, and I was incredibly fortunate. But I've now been in government in one way or another for about 30 years, and at least for me and so many of the people I work with, whatever the other compensations may be in other, in other pursuits, there's nothing quite like going to work every day with the flag behind your back. Absolutely. So, I felt we happen that. to have a table <laughs> outside. Check it out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we want more UT graduates to go into the Foreign Service because we bring a great 
educational experience, and um, I think we could be a value added. There is no question. Um, there is a question, and we really haven't touched on economics and mm -hmm. trade, uh, from Ryan Ashley, a PhD candidate, Air Force officer, and Clements graduate fellow. And he's saying, how can the administration address the credibility gap on economic engagement with Southeast Asia to enhance trust and complement existing security and political efforts, especially considering the U.S. hasn't attempted to rejoin the reformed Trans-Pacific Partnership? So the economic dimension of what we're doing around the world is fundamental. Uh, it's a critical part of our, our foreign policy. It, it, it answers uh, what other people are looking for and what they need, uh, as well as what we're looking for and what we need. And trade is a critical piece of that. But we want to make sure that in everything we're doing, uh, we're, we're working to create a race to the top, not a race to the bottom, to make sure that what we're doing actually benefits not only uh, growth, but inclusive growth that everyone shares in. We want to make sure that our companies are benefiting, but also our workers are benefiting from the agreements that we reach. And that's what has been driving us in our approach. We also want to make sure that we are dealing with the issues that are really the dominant issues for the 21st century when it comes to the global economy. And we are, including, uh, including in Asia. Uh, we have a partnership now um, that we have um, stood up with about uh, 14 other countries in the Indo-Pacific that gets at the critical economic issues for, for this time, including um, digital technology and trade in the digital space, uh, include, uh, including building strong, resilient supply chains. We've all experienced what it's like when you have a supply chain that's disrupted for something you really need, uh, doing that. Uh, making sure that we're facilitating the trade that exists so that there are common understandings about regulations uh, and so forth. Um, so across the board, we're trying to address the question of economic relations and trade in ways that are going to, uh, going to benefit uh, us as a whole, uh, but also answer challenges that other countries are trying to face. We've had a lot of receptivity uh, to what we're doing. Uh, there's another component to this. Uh, there is a huge demand, an insatiable demand around the world for infrastructure. Um, and there is more demand than there is supply uh, in this moment. One of the things that we've done is to start an initiative with the other leading economies, democratic economies in the world, the G7, to bring more resources to that and to use those resources to leverage private sector investment in infrastructure. But infrastructure that is, again, a race to the top. Other countries have been engaged in trying to provide infrastructure around the world, but I think what some countries have experienced uh, with that is um, a massive piling on, on de of debt for these projects, um, having workers from the country in question imported to do the projects instead of local workers, uh, pro technology infrastructure built to low standards without care for the environment or the rights of the workers who are actually building the infrastructure. We're doing this in a way that is positive, affirmative, answers the needs of countries, but does it in a way, again, that um, I think is uh, uh, not abusive of the countries in question. I was in South America this summer on a NASA-sponsored uh, tour talking to Argentina, Brazil, and Colombia uh, about uh, ways to cooperate in space mm. and satellite presentations and uh, building. And China was everywhere. They were in the infrastructure field. They were, uh, as you said, that's not necessarily a plus if the infrastructure isn't going to be maintained in the right way. But they are really paying attention and um, I think that we have to um, be focused on what we can do in the right way, and especially where countries have a, a democratic background. Um, we have democracies in South America. They're not always resilient. Um, and how can we work with our South American 
um, interest, especially in the economy and trade, because that's what they need the most. But how would you say that we should be producing uh, more for South America, which is right in our hemisphere, and, um, and what are your plans to uh, produce more? Well, it's exactly why uh, the President brought all of the countries of the hemisphere together at the Summit for the Americas, mm -hmm. uh, to look at how we can actually make our own hemisphere the champion for, uh, for growth, for progress in the world. And I think uh, he believes, we believe, uh, that we can and should be able to do that, precisely because we do have, despite challenges in various places, uh, a strong democratic foundation. We do have a hemisphere that can be more and more integrated um, and that's exactly what we're pursuing with uh, Mexico and Canada, our near neighbors, but also to points much, much further south. And the work that we're doing, uh, I think, is, is advancing exactly uh, that objective. There's another aspect to this that's so important, and it comes back to the migration question. Another piece to the puzzle, maybe the most critical piece to the puzzle, is this. Uh, you have to get at the root causes of migration. And depending on where you are in the world, um, there may be one driver or another. It may be a repressive government, it may be violence, it may be corruption. In our own hemisphere, it tends to be a lack of economic opportunity, even the most basic economic opportunity. And here's the thing, and I suspect if we really think about it ourselves, we'd probably come to the same conclusion. If you're a parent and you literally cannot put food on the table for your kids, you are likely to try to do anything to be able to do that. And that includes maybe going anywhere, if there's a greater prospect of doing that, somewhere else. And we know that it's not as if people get up in the, day, in the morning and say, gee, wouldn't this be a great day to leave everything and everyone I know behind, to put myself in the hands of a trafficker, to make an incredibly hazardous journey, uh, to come to a country that may or may not want me, uh, with a language that I may not yet speak, uh, without uh, friends, family, community. Most people who make that decision make it because there are profound drivers uh, that are pushing them to do that. So if you can address those drivers, if you can give people enough hope, real hope, that they can build their lives and build their futures at home, where most people prefer to remain, that is a key, a key part of dealing with this challenge. And that means driving investment. Uh, it means helping countries build that kind of uh, opportunity, again, with the private sector in the, in the lead, um, to create that kind of future. The problem, of course, with that is it takes time. It's not like flipping a light switch. But we're very much engaged in doing it. One example. Um, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, these countries which have been a source of migration uh, for some time. Uh, just over the past couple of years, led by the Vice President, Vice President Harris, we have gotten uh, about four and a half billion dollars in new investment in those countries for enterprises that are going to create jobs and give people an opportunity to stay home and care for, the, for their families right there. Now, you've got to do that at a, at a massive scale, and like most things, the opportunities that we've actually been able to create, uh, those numbers don't show up uh, at our border, but of course we don't know that. Um, you only see the people who do. But this is also the way to get at it, and this do goes to the larger question of how we can make our own hemisphere uh, more and more integrated economically. And it is in our interest to do that for sure. Um, uh, the last question is going to be uh, from um, Maddie Williams, a Clements graduate fellow, a PhD student at the LBJ School, and she has read your Global War of Ideas in the early 2000s, and she's asking, do you think the perception gap has shifted favorably or unfavorably with respect to the U.S. in the two decades since you wrote that first paper? Hmm. Is the U.S. Hmm. winning the War it's of Ideas? It's a great question. And um, when I was thinking about that before, this is back in 2001, 2002, 
it was right after 9-11. And in a very different way, we were engaged not only in a physical conflict with terrorists, uh, terrorist groups, but also in ideas and ideology that grounded that and that, for one reason or another, might have attracted people to extremism. And so back then, what I was thinking about was how do we engage that, that, that aspect uh, of the, the conflict with, uh, with terrorism, and how do we engage effectively in this, in this war of ideas? Now, of course, we're in a very different wor world and, and a very different uh, war of ideas, and it really does go to what I was talking about before, this competition to shape the what comes next. We ended the post-Cold War era, the competition to shape this, this future, a huge component of it, are different ideas about what that future should look like. We have a clear vision of what we would like the world to look like, uh, a world that is free, that is uh, open, that is secure, uh, that's prosperous, that's connected, that's resilient. Um, Others have a very different vision for what the world will, will look like. We want a world in which uh, people are free in their, uh, in their lives and in their, in their choices, in which countries are able to decide their own policies and their own partners, um, in which technology is used to lift people up, not to, not to hold them down, and in which countries agree uh, on a basic set of, of rules through which they're going to engage and work with one another. Um, we have adversaries, uh, opponents, who have a very different vision of a world, as I said earlier, where in different ways might makes right, uh, where they have spheres of influence, uh, where they dictate not only what happens to their own people, uh, but what happens in their, in their neighborhoods, where economics are used as tools of coercion to help advance the decisions and policies that they prefer, and where technology is used in negative ways uh, to keep people down, not, not lift them up. So they're very different visions, and part of our job is to, as effectively as we can, actually communicate them, because I have little doubt that if, if given a real and fair choice, we know where most people want to end up. But we have another problem, and that is the very technology that we use to try to advance these visions to make our case, to explain our case, is also used to misinform, to disinform, to distort. Um, many of us, when you were brought up reading the great works of social thinking and social science from centuries past, you might read John Stuart Mill, and you might read about how in the marketplace of ideas, the best ideas rise to the top, compete against each other, and the very best idea wins out. But if the very system that those ideas are emerging in is distorted, um, then you've got a fundamental problem. So one of the biggest challenges we have in this new war of ideas is dealing with problems of disinformation, of misinformation, of making sure that um, to the best of our ability, we actually have real space where ideas can compete fairly and clearly, uh, and in that world, uh, everything that we represent, that we stand for, and have long stood for, will do very well. But that's not the world that we're operating in, and it's why it's so critical that we, with many other countries, make sure that we preserve, create, and defend that space. And that's before we introduce AI. That's, I exactly. mean, think of the changes that we're going to have to prepare for and engage in to protect our right. intellectual property and our communications that will be absolute rather than an artificial intelligence coming in and that's a whole other technology that issue. is that is the, the that is the new frontier and mm -hmm. one of the things that we've been very focused on is making sure that we're doing what we can do to ensure that AI is used for good and that we mitigate the potential downsides. The potential for what AI can do to solve the most fundamental problems we're facing around the world is almost limitless. We had at the uh, UN General Assembly, we brought countries together 
looking on how we can use artificial intelligence to advance the sustainable development goals mm -hmm. that the UN has been working on for the better part of a decade. And it is extraordinary. But at the same time, to your point, we know the, the damage, the harm that could be done by the misuse of AI. So we spent a lot of time with the, the companies, the foundational companies that are all American uh, that have been leading the, uh, the work on AI. And they came together and agreed to certain commitments to try to ensure that the technology is used uh, for good and uh, at the same time to mitigate any of the downside risks. My job now at the State Department is to take those commitments, to take those understandings reached between the, the White House and these uh, foundational companies and internationalize them, socialize them around the world, get other countries to sign on and to sign up so that we create a foundation of, of understanding about how AI can be used and how it, it shouldn't be used. This is just the dawn of that effort. And I think you're exactly right, maybe more than anything else, that's going to shape the future that we all live in. If we can have an alliance of rules-based order right. that will um, require everyone to accede to the right regulations. That's going to be difficult, as you know. So, well, we have run out of time. Actually, we're over time, and I thank you so much for coming to visit with us, and we, of course, wish you well. Going to Mexico, there are so many issues that we need to be in partnership with Mexico uh, to achieve for both of our sides of the border. Thank and you. we thank you for stopping in. Thank you. And I know it's been, I know it's a busy week here. So thank you for having me. Thank you.